The building blocks of life have been found in asteroid samples. The most volcanic activity ever seen on Io. Astronauts are searching for bacteria on the outside of the space station. And Ingenuity found fast wind speeds on Mars. All this and more in this week's Space Bites. NASA's OSIRIS-REx mission returned to Earth in September 2023, and it was carrying samples from asteroid Bennu. It took them a while to actually crack into the sample container, but once they did, they took out a little over 100 grams of material and then handed it out to various researchers around the world. And now these researchers have had time with some of the greatest labs on Earth, and they're starting to understand more about what is in those samples. And so this week, we got a series of announcements from various working groups about what it is that they had found. So the first thing is amino acids. And all life on Earth uses these 20 basic amino acids. And researchers found 14 of those amino acids. But what's interesting is that all of life on Earth uses what are called left handed molecules to form the building blocks of life. And the mixture of amino acids on asteroid Bennu were a combination of left and right and pretty evenly divided between those two directions. And so it's an interesting question that continues which is why does life on Earth use this left handed organic molecule structure? They also found ammonia and formaldehyde, which are two chemicals that are thought to be the precursors for these amino acids. So not only do you have the amino acids, but you have the raw materials for amino acids. They also found all five of the nucleobases. These are the molecules that are used to code DNA and RNA. And this is more than what they found on the Ryugu samples. I think they found two in the Ryugu samples and five in the Bennu samples. And then a different group of researchers found 11 different chemicals, which are only present when minerals have been dissolved in salt water for a long period of time. So it indicates that whatever Bennu is, it was wet for some long period of time, whether part of a larger object or something. And then what's also really interesting is that, you know, we have two samples of asteroids that have been returned, actually three with Hayabusa 1, but very little. So with Hayabusa 2, we got these samples of asteroid Ryugu, and researchers have been announcing the various chemicals that they found. And then with asteroid Bennu, we have this other example of an asteroid. And researchers studying the two different asteroids have found a lot of similar chemicals. And so what the larger story story that this is giving us is that you've got a lot of the raw material for life. A lot of the ingredients are out there present in the solar system really early after the solar system forms. And this could be a really viable mechanism for how this material is being delivered to Earth and somehow turned into the life that we see today. An asteroid mining mission has found its target. Now we have been reporting on the prospects of asteroid mining for decades and companies pop up and they're going to be doing asteroid mining and they raise a bunch of funding and then it turns out that asteroid mining is much more complicated much more expensive the infrastructure is not there to be able to provide launch services to be able to figure out a way to bring this stuff back but it's such a tantalizing idea that there are asteroids out there that are rich in the kinds of metals that are actually very rare down here on Earth. You know, we always hear about how there are asteroids that are worth quadrillions of dollars if you could just get that material back from Earth. But so far, it's more cost effective to just dig a hole in the ground than to try to go to space to find some. But People continue to try to turn this into a profitable business. And so the next company that's going to take a crack at this is called Astro Forge. And they have announced that they have chosen a target for their upcoming Odin mission. So the target is called Asteroid 2022 OB5. And this is a mineral rich asteroid that's just a few dozen meters across, so very small. But what's handy about it is that it's going to be doing a very close flyby of the Earth in early 2026. It's gonna come within about 650,000 kilometers of the Earth, which is like a little farther away than the distance from the Earth to the moon. This is the ideal opportunity to try and do an interception. And so Astroforge is planning on 
launching their Odin mission with an upcoming Intuitive Machines launch in February. This is then going to hang out in the area until that flyby about 300 days after the launch and then take some close up images of the asteroid as it flies by. And that'll be like the first step in asteroid mining where you you prospect the asteroid to find out if it's got the right kind of metals and the minerals and if it could be worth doing any kind of mining later on down the road. So there's a couple of interesting milestones with this mission. So one is that if they actually pull this off, they'll be the first deep space private mission, which would be pretty exciting. But then the other thing is, is that to be able to fly far away from the Earth, to be able to go and reach some target, you need to be able to use the deep space network. This is what NASA uses to communicate with all of its spacecraft. But the problem is that it is oversubscribed. And so you can't just launch a spacecraft and hope that you can use the deep space network. And so Astroforge is keeping the spacecraft relatively close to the Earth so they can take advantage of private communication systems. Massive volcanic activity on Io. Io is the most volcanically active place in the solar system. At any time, there are more than 400 volcanoes going off on the surface of Io. But during a recent flyby, NASA's Juno spacecraft observed this incredibly volcanic region at the South Pole of Io. Just to give you some context, the largest volcanic region that's known about on Io before this is called Loki, and it is about 20,000 square kilometers of lava flows. And this new one that's at the South Pole seems to have about 100,000 square kilometers. So it's like five times bigger. And that is larger than Lake Superior on Earth. But lava. And according to NASA, the amount of energy that is being produced by this lava lake on Io is about six times as much energy as all of Earth's power generation. So it's like 80 trillion watts of energy are coming out of this lava lake. We could have had a mission to Io, but instead we got missions to Venus, which is great. Venus is fine and all, but if we could get a mission that would do regular flybys of Io, we could get a much better understanding of the surface and even interior of Io. So you know, maybe let's bring back that mission. Two giant planets messing with each other's orbits. Astronomers have found a bizarre exoplanetary system where there are two giant planets orbiting around in a two to one resonance. And what this causes is that as the two planets are going around, they are pulling at each other and changing the timing of their orbits. So one planet has 3.8 times the mass of Jupiter and it completes its orbit on average every 82 days. And then the second planet has 1.4 Jupiter masses. The bigger planet is a transiting planet. So it passes directly in front of the star. And so they can measure its precise timings. The second planet is not perfectly lined up. And so they can only detect it using the radial velocity method they can detect as the star is being pulled around by the second planet. There's also a third mini Neptune in the system, but it just has to watch this mayhem. And so because the two planets are locked in this two to one resonance, you get a change in the timing of the orbit by four days. So sometimes, depending on how the planets are lined up, that transit that year length will change by four days. And that's just for the planet, they can actually see it transiting in front of the star, they assume that the smaller one is more like six days. And that's pretty significant for having your the length of your year change by four days. Imagine if that happened here on Earth, searching for microbes outside the International Space Station. So when I am recording this episode of Space Bites, two astronauts are currently on a spacewalk on the outside of the International Space Station. Sonny Williams and Butch Wilmer, those are the people who were stranded on the station when Starliner wasn't able to bring them home. And so NASA sent up a SpaceX Crew Dragon with two seats empty. And so they'll take those seats to come back down to Earth. That's the accurate version of it. But those who know will know. So they were performing a bunch of activities on the outside of the station, but one of their jobs was to collect samples from outside where the environmental system vents off into space. And the question is, are bacteria inside the space station getting outside the station and then adhering to the exterior? As we continue our exploration of the solar system and as we go to more sensitive places in the solar system, like going to places on Mars, potentially sending spacecraft to the surface of Europa or in 
Enceladus, this idea of planetary protection comes in. What can we do to minimize the chances that Earth life is going to infect these other places? And so by seeing where you've got Earth life that is being thrown outside into space and has to try and survive, we will find out just how hardy our Earth life is and what are the kinds of organisms that we should watch out for. And NASA has done experiments. There are these trays on the outside of the International Space Station where they put various kinds of hardy life forms like cyanobacteria or or tardigrades, mosses, lichens, things like that, and then they expose them to space for years. And then they bring them back to Earth. And they find that these life forms are still viable. And so this is a more rough version, like just the standard biome that human beings are spewing out. And that's making its way out into space. Can that survive? We'll find out. Every week we do a vote on our channel where you tell us what you thought was the best space news story of the week. And the winner last week was the enormous 2.5 billion pixel image of Andromeda. So thank you everybody who voted last week. Now we will put the new vote within about 24 hours of when we post Space Bites into the community tab on our channel. So if you're just scrolling on your phone and you see the vote come up, just pick one. And then next week, we will count up the votes and we will celebrate the winner. Obviously, the best chance to see this vote is to subscribe to our channel and click on the notifications bell. Ingenuity measured the wind speed on Mars. During its 72 flights on Mars, NASA's Ingenuity helicopter was able to gather a tremendous amount about the red planet. It served as an aerial scout, following along with Perseverance, scouting out the terrain, helping scientists pick interesting targets. And of course, it was also gathering a tremendous amount of information about the planet itself. It was taking pictures of the surface, it was measuring the atmosphere, and researchers recently came up with a paper where they showed that the wind speeds on Mars were actually a little higher than they had been predicting. Before they sent Ingenuity, the models that they had developed suggested that the wind speeds on the surface of Mars would be about 15 meters per second, which is about 54 kilometers per hour. But Ingenuity actually measured wind speeds that were more like 25 meters per second, which is about 90 kilometers per hour. How they measured the wind speeds is really clever. So obviously you could send a wind speed instrument as part of the instrument payload on the helicopter, but that's more weight and that's potentially some electricity. And so instead what they did was they would just try and make the helicopter hover and then it would have to tilt itself into the wind to maintain its hovering position. And then based on the tilt, which they could measure with onboard accelerometers, they could tell how fast the wind was going. Obviously, having an accurate, actually measured wind speed is going to be very useful when there are going to be future missions. There's going to be a helicopter going with every mission to Mars from here on out, I think. And so having a much more accurate idea of what the wind speeds are like is going to be really helpful. Learning even more about M87 supermassive black hole. In 2017, a worldwide network of radio telescopes came together to produce the first ever images of the event horizon at the heart of the supermassive black hole M87. This is the event horizon telescope. And they then went on to take an image of the supermassive black hole at the heart of the Milky Way. But observations have been continuing. And since that first 2017 data were gathered, another 120,000 images have been taken of that region by the Event Horizon Telescope and astronomers have continued to crunch through all those data. And so they've learned a few new things about the supermassive black hole. One that is very interesting is they now have a confirmation that the black hole itself, its axis isn't pointed towards the Earth. So they've been able to measure the angle that the axis is pointed to directly. And then the other thing is that they've been able to measure turbulence in the disk. They can actually see bright spots moving in the disk around this supermassive black hole changing over time. It links to this idea that you've got turbulence in the accretion disk that is around the supermassive black hole. And these link to structures that you see in the event horizon. The problem with the event horizon telescope is that they only have really two targets that they can look at. One is this black hole at the heart of M87. The other is the black hole at the heart of the Milky Way, because those are the two largest visually black holes that they have to work with. And so each time they 
get the band back together and they take more data on these two supermassive black holes. We will learn more and more about them. But hopefully we'll have this future where we add more telescopes that are outside of the Earth, maybe something on the moon, maybe something in orbit, where you increase the size of the baseline and then you can get higher resolution. And then that brings other supermassive black holes into view. Predicting solar flares with machine learning. Last week, I talked about some news about how researchers have been able to connect the flashing of coronal loops on the surface of the sun with the powerful solar flares that come out of those regions. It's a new way to predict where solar flares are going to happen. And so this week, we've got another story that's kind of similar. So you have these large regions on the sun where there's activity that you can see like sunspot complexes, there are these coronal loops surrounding them, you can see, you know, flares come off of these regions, coronal mass ejections. And there's a lot of complicated physics that's going on in this area with the magnetic fields and the various turbulence on the surface of the sun. And it's not the kind of thing that a human being can easily notice the patterns. But this is the kind of thing that these machine learning algorithms are really good for. And so one of the things that's really hard to predict is how long is it going to take for a coronal mass ejection from when it gets emitted off the surface of the sun? How long does it take to reach the Earth? And up until this point, the best we can do is many hours. But researchers have been training a machine learning algorithm based on various active regions on the sun from the mid 90s until very recently. And then they took that really powerful solar flare event that happened back in May 2024, and then used their algorithm to predict what should happen. And they were able to very accurately predict the kinds of activity and that if a coronal mass ejection was hurled off the sun, they were able to predict the time to within about a minute of when it actually did arrive on Earth. And so you've now got these tools coming on board to help us understand the activity on the sun and see patterns in ways that it's very difficult to just do the math that will figure that out. And so hopefully, you know, understanding space weather will become a better solved problem. And of course, you know, we want as much notice as we can get when there's really powerful space weather, because it has an effect here on Earth, it disrupts our communications, it can cause electrical networks to go down, it can cause problems with our satellites. And of course, it also tells you when to go outside to look at really cool auroras. So the more we can do this, the better. Now you're watching this week's episode of Space Bites, and I am writing my weekly email newsletter called The Guide to Space. And there we've got dozens more space stories that we don't have time to talk about here on the show. For example, these cool features on Mars that are caused by carbon dioxide geysers. Could we communicate with gravitational waves? and some amazing pictures of Comet G3 Atlas. So I write this newsletter every Friday, it goes out to 70,000 of my best friends, there's no ads in it at all. It's completely free. So check it out, go to universe today.com slash newsletter to sign up. I'm going to talk about some recent interviews. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. A special thanks to Abe Kingston, Adam Schaefer, Andrew M. Gross, Barry Lake Grooving, David Gildenhead, David Matz, Dennis Silberti, Dustin Cable, James Clark, Jeremy Madden, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Josh Schultz, Paul Robach, Sean Sargent, Spidersoft.io, Stephen Fowler Menley, Thomas L. Scadron, and Vlad Shiplin, who support us at the Master of the Universe level. And all our patrons, all your support means the universe to us. I've got a flood of interviews that are coming shortly and have already been released. In fact, we have so many that we're going to have to release at least one video every single day for probably weeks on end. And part of this is thanks to the NIAC Awards. I've had a chance to talk to over half of the 2025 NIAC recipients so far, and I have more interviews coming. I they're like Pokemons, I got to collect them all. But I did a recent interview that I really think you should check out. And this is an interview about the Trappist one system with Megan G. Luca. I've had so many questions about like, when are we going to find out about the atmospheres on the Trappist one planets? Because you know, these are the most exciting exoplanets that have ever been found. You've got these Earth sized worlds that are orbiting within the habitable zone of an M dwarf, where you could have liquid water on the surface. Do they have atmospheres? And James Webb has been examining the atmospheres of these planets one by one. And yet the results have been kind of inconclusive. And so Megan, explains in just incredible detail 
where we're at and why it's been so tricky, but also kind of exciting and gives us an idea of what's coming up for the future. And so, you know, a lot of people have said this is the best interview that they've seen on the channel in a long time. And so if you skipped it, haven't seen it yet, I highly recommend you go and check it out. I think you'll really enjoy it. All right, we'll see you next week.